Good morning and welcome to our special service today. It is I'm sorry, to... Reverend Dave, but I have breaking news, sensational breaking news to bring to you. I'm Jacob Goldman, reporting for NIV TV, live from Jerusalem. We are receiving reports that a man officially declared dead is in fact alive and well. We should be receiving live footage, I think, from the scene itself. Yes, yes, I believe this is the mother of the man. You may recall three days ago we reported on the trial and the crucifixion and the death of Jesus, or as the Romans called him, cruelly, King of the Jews. Many witnesses saw him die. And let's face it, the Romans know how to kill people. But, and I will be very clear here, it's not just women who have seen it. We have reliable witnesses claiming he is alive. They have seen him walking and talking outside of the tomb. The Roman governor Pilate, unavailable for comment, no surprise there. But the temple authorities, I will quote, said, what is important here is to understand that this man was found guilty, sentenced to death, and the sentence was carried out. Rumors of some kind of resurrection are lies spread by people wishing to stir up trouble. What is important here? We said to them, what is important here is, where is the body? But there was no one prepared to come and talk to us. Here on NITV, we predicted that this story wasn't going to go away. And I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, young people, mark my words, this time next year, we will be asking ourselves, is he alive? Who is this Jesus? Where did he go? Will he come back? What are we to believe? This is Jacob Goldman reporting for NIV TV. Back to the service, Reverend Dave. <laughs> Jacob Goldman, I can confirm it is true. Jesus is alive. So let's stand, shall we? And let's share these words together. Friends, the tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. For three days he lay in that cold and lonely cave. But God's love cannot be contained by anything, not even death. And now he is risen. Alleluia. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Come, let us worship the risen Christ.
Lord Jesus, we do thank you that as we come to celebrate today that you are alive, that death has been conquered, that your resurrection changes everything. And as we come and worship you and hear this story afresh, may you speak deep into our hearts. May you soften our hearts right now to hear your story proclaimed again. And may we leave here with boldness and confidence in this incredible way that you have transformed us and brought us salvation and brought us life in all its fullness. So we thank you, we bless you, we worship you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Do be seated. As I was saying earlier before I was rudely interrupted, a really warm welcome to each and every one of you, especially if you're a visitor today, if this is your first time, or if you come with family, a really warm welcome to you. Please be yourself, join in with whatever you're able to, um, and uh, just we pray that you will encounter God deeply today. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Dave, I'm the rector here, and uh, Daryl, one of our preachers, is going to be uh, preaching later on. Uh, the children are going to be in for uh, a bit at the beginning, they're going to go out for the sermon and the prayers, and they're going to come back in again at the end where we're going to all share communion with each other um, before we finish. And then at the end, we of course have the great St. Andrew's Easter egg rolling competition. But more of that later. Um, so children, I want to just um, show you a bit of a video now, which just says something about why the resurrection is so important. And how that Jesus' death and resurrection can change us, even here, 2,000 years later. So watch very carefully and I hope there's something for everybody in this uh, really powerful little video. The very first Easter morning, Jesus' friends had the biggest and best surprise. Jesus is alive. The empty tomb made them confused. It was where Jesus was buried, but his body wasn't there. Then the risen Jesus met them, and they were delighted. He was still the Jesus they knew and loved. They knew his voice, they felt his body, they saw the wounds. The same Jesus, but he was changed. He was alive to never die again. This world lost its power over him. He could appear in locked rooms and leave. Sin and sadness lost power over him. The same Jesus was changed. And the risen Jesus changed them. They'd betrayed Jesus. But he spoke peace and forgave their sins. They were lost and confused. But Jesus made them bold and brave in making his forgiveness known to everyone. The risen Jesus changed them. He broke the power of sin and sadness over them. The risen Jesus keeps changing people. Saul was proud and angry. He spent his time attacking Jesus' followers. Sin and sadness controlled him. On the road to Damascus, the risen Jesus met Paul in a blinding light. He challenged Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus made Saul blind to everything around him and gave him a clear vision that Jesus was the Saviour and the Lord and alive. When Jesus made Saul see again, Saul was changed. The power of sin and sadness over Saul was broken. He changed his name to Paul and spent his life joyously telling everyone to trust Jesus as Saviour and Lord. The risen Jesus is still changing people. He breaks the power of sin and sadness for everyone who trusts him. The risen Jesus changes us. 
Knowing Jesus loves us so much he died for us, we're bold and free to love others. Knowing Jesus beat death for us, all our sadness will one day be joy. Like the first Easter, we celebrate that Jesus is alive. He's with us and changing us. The risen Jesus changes us. He breaks the power of sin and sadness and he transforms us so that we can know life in its fullness. Let's just pray and thank God for that. Lord, we thank you that actually the resurrection changed everything. Thank you that we can be forgiven, that our mistakes can be wiped clean, that we can know you as our friend and that you can always be with us helping us, giving us peace, giving us joy. And help us to live as changed people, to live as resurrection people, to proclaim as Paul did, your amazing story to our broken world. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing again before the children go out and we're going to sing one of our Easter songs and I would love to invite any children who want to come to grab a banner, a flag or to come and grab an instrument and come and make music and joyfully praise God together. So let's stand. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my saviour on that cursed tree his body bowed
So the children are going to go out with Helen now, and if any of the um, Pathfinders want to go out and help Helen or any of the other, anyone else wants to go out and help Helen, please do, because I think there are quite a few children this morning. Uh, you're going to come back after the sermon and join us later, but uh, go and have fun. I think you're going to do a bit of an Easter egg hunt and some crafts. And uh, if everyone else just take a seat and maybe you want to just say hello to the person next to you and uh, say happy Easter to them and ask them whether they went to the beacon this morning at half past six. And we celebrate the risen Jesus, Easter joy, love poured out, infusing this world with rivers of grace and hope of rebirth. And don't we need that as we look around our hurting and groaning world today? We need prayer for grace and hope. So let's offer our thoughts and prayers to God now as we ask you, Lord God, to pour your love and hope into the war-torn places of our world today. We think especially of Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan. And in the silence we offer our prayers to you, Lord. Jesus, Easter joy, love poured out, infusing this world with rivers of grace and hope of rebirth. We pray you pour your love and hope into the places where freedoms are limited or non-existent. And in the silence we offer you our prayers. Jesus, Easter joy, love poured out, infusing our world with rivers of grace and hope of rebirth. Pour your love and hope into those who are at this very moment suffering from hunger or lack of basic needs. And in the silence we offer you our prayers. Jesus, Easter joy, love poured out, infusing our world with rivers of grace and hope of rebirth. Pour your love and hope, we pray, into those who are today suffering from illness, from anxiety, from grief. And again in the silence we offer our prayers. Jesus, Easter joy, love poured out, infusing our world with rivers of grace and hope of rebirth. Pour your love and hope into the physical world you created to reduce pollution, to reverse the destruction of natural habitats and wildlife, to save our planet from our own greed. And in the silence we offer our prayers.
Jesus, Easter joy, love poured out, infusing the world with rivers of grace and hope of rebirth. Pour your love and hope into our hearts that we may drink from the stream that never runs dry and demonstrate your love to our neighbours, our fellow citizens, and even those people we don't know but whose lives are affected by our choices. Jesus, Easter joy, love poured out, infusing this world with rivers of grace and hope of rebirth. We know our prayers and your resurrection power can and does make a difference. And so we thank you in the name of the risen Jesus. Amen. <coughs> the reading is from Matthew chapter 28 starting at the first verse <coughs> after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Good morning. So I love that, um, the way the angels spoke with the ladies, where they say, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus. And maybe that there are people here who are looking for Jesus. So I just want to say, don't be afraid. I can twist the words a bit. Um, don't be afraid because he, he is here. Because he rose from the dead. Let's hear the story. Um, we love Easter here. Uh, we love Easter for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is because sometimes people come and visit us on Easter in our meetings and the main, main reason that we love Easter is because we love this story this story of Jesus rising from the dead is right at the middle of our lives and we love the chance to tell it I'm just so delighted for the chance to be standing in front of you to tell you this story this morning um, you may have a chance, or you will have a chance, if you're a person who doesn't 
currently believe in Jesus, you haven't currently trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll have a chance today to change that. So just forewarning, okay? Full disclosure. This is a preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're a person who needs that, then it's here for you today. So, first of all, the events of Easter Sunday were quite something. They're quite extraordinary. It began on, uh, on Friday, where Jesus died. So, uh, these are the events that we celebrated on Good Friday, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And then they put him into a tomb, which was a bit unusual for a crucified person. Normally, they were thrown into a common grave, like a pit in the ground. But uh, a man called Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea kind of snuck in and was able to get Jesus' body out and buried properly in a tomb. Then three days went past. Uh, and after the third day, we have the events of today, which what essentially happened is people went to, uh, to do some preparations on the body of Jesus. In, in the Middle East, when somebody dies, there is an entombing process that needs to happen. And really, it's quite hot there. Bodies tend to start going a bit rank pretty quickly. So these ladies were wanting to get in and do some proper preparation of the body. It was a very quick burial, so they had to kind of sort him out for his, uh, for his long death, really. Uh, and they got there and found to their amazement that the tomb was empty. So it was very, they weren't expecting the tomb to be empty. And no, no one was expecting the tomb to be, to be empty. Uh, then, so... As someone said before, the Romans were very, very good at killing people and they really knew when people were dead. So Jesus was well and properly dead by the time he was buried. Um, so we've got the empty tomb and then you've heard the story about the women that met, met Jesus coming from the tomb. They go to tell his disciples and then there's a long period of his disciples coming to believe this. And in fact, if you read the accounts of the resurrection, the word that comes out again and again is doubt. They weren't sure this was really Jesus. And it really took time and convincing. And Jesus himself having to do things to say, it's really me. Uh, these are holes in my hand. See them. Put your hand in my side. There was a spear mark in his side, a big hole. Put your hand in it. Convince yourself it's me. I eat things. I'm really alive. I'm not a ghost, some kind of phantasm. And the disciples became eventually convinced. Then something else amazing happened. About 50 days later, these disciples who, who had been running in fear at Jesus' crucifixion and had been totally quiet for 50 days, we heard nothing of them, they suddenly popped up and started preaching in the temple. So these were people who were terrified of being caught and arrested by the Romans and possibly crucified as well they suddenly begin speaking boldly about the death of Jesus Christ. So those are the events. And um, <laughs> what's, what's an interesting thing about when the disciples began preaching is it sort of conveniently happened after Jesus had ascended into heaven. So you've got this period of time where Jesus was appearing to his disciples according to their account. And then after 50 days, Jesus has ascended into heaven. He's not around anymore. And then they say, he's alive. So the first thing would be, well, wheel him out. Oh no, he's actually ascended into heaven. And so then they have a story to tell. And they tell their story. And actually they stake their lives on the story of the 11 remaining uh, apostles of Jesus. Judas, obviously, we've heard of Judas. He did his own thing. The 11 remaining, 10 of them were martyred for their faith, often in extremely brutal, brutal circumstances. The 11th, John, um, tradition has that he was boiled in oil but survived and died of old age in exile. So, uh, so John kind of had a little experimental martyrdom but survived it. So these were people who were willing to, they were willing to pay the ultimate price for the story they were telling. Now there's a lot of great books around that will help you to work through the events of Easter Sunday. Um, they take the various accounts that people tried to roll out about it and, and show the likelihood of them being true or not. 
And just, you're going to have to believe it from me, that the account of the Bible is the most plausible. Even if you don't believe in miracles, it's so much more plausible than any other account. Any sort of the disciples stole his body, or he just swooned on the cross, any of that's just absurd, much more absurd than Jesus rising from the dead. I'm not going to talk much more about that today. I'd love to. But there's actually something, I think, um, even more exciting about Easter than the facts of Easter. And that is um, why, let me go back there for a minute, why it was that Jesus died on the cross. And why I think that's important is that there are, there are amazing things that happen in the world. I mean, I, was, I watched the Olympics when Usain Bolt ran 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. That was amazing. Does anyone else see that? That was an amazing thing. But it doesn't really affect my life. Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, that was really amazing. That was as amazing as you can imagine. But the question a person could ask is, okay, that was 2,000 years ago, an amazing thing happened. How does that make a difference to me? And that's what we want to talk about today. Because the interesting thing about the resurrection of Jesus is that he died for you. This is a lot of words. We're going to pick through them in a minute. If you have a Bible, uh, one of these blue things in the book in the uh, in the pockets in front of you if you look at a page yeah, I'm finding it rapidly now just so I can segue smoothly page 1076 is where this comes out you can see context if you want to read it so this is Jesus speaking to his disciples well before his crucifixion and he said I am the good shepherd I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father he's talking about God there and then he says some amazing things. I lay down my life for the sheep. So here's Jesus very much alive saying, do you know something? I'm going to lay my life down for you. So he's referring to his disciples when he talks about the sheep. Then he says, I have sheep that are other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. This is actually all of us. All of, really all of the world. Because the Bible says Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. The other sheep are those that come in from all over the world. They too will listen to my voice. There shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is this, that I lay down my life. And here's where it gets a bit strange. Only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. Remember the account we just read, if you did the Good Friday messages as well. Jesus was arrested by a group of temple guard and he was brutalized by the Roman guard and he was uh, dragged up or forced up onto a, onto a hill where he was nailed to a cross and crucified. And yet Jesus says, I lay my life down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So in these words, well before Jesus' death, we learn three, three different things. Firstly, Jesus' death was to be temporary. I, I lay it down only to take it up again. So he said before, I'm not going to be dead for long. Secondly, his death was to be voluntary. Nobody takes my life from me. It might look like the Romans are doing this to me, but I am voluntarily laying my life down for my sheep. And it is, it's a long word, substitutionary. So I lay my life down for my sheep. That means Jesus said, I am dying not for myself, not for anything in me, but I am dying for others. So it's a death that I die in place of others or for the sake of others. Let me find my page. And after he spoke these words, and was crucified, then he did rise from the dead. So the temporary thing is true. If a person, it's, Jesus is not the only person in history to have risen from the dead. His resurrection is unique in other ways. Um, other people have risen from the dead. But he is the only person that I've ever heard of who said, I will rise from the dead and did. If somebody says that, then you want to pay attention to the other things he said. 
So it'd be wise to pay attention that he said, this is my choice. I do this voluntarily. No, not even God is making me do this. I am doing this. I choose to do this. Why? Because I love the sheep. And then we want to pay attention to this third word that it is substitutionary. In John 3.16, you know, I've heard that verse before probably, it says that he died for the whole world. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him may not die but have eternal life. This is where it gets very, very personal. So something that happened 2,000 years ago remains very personal for us today because God actually says that what happened there transmits through all of history to all of the world for every person. So it stops being a story, like a history lesson we read, and it starts being a little bit like if you attend the reading of a will and you find that you are in the beneficiaries of the will. Oh, you know, I'm going to give my, uh, my car to this person and my record collection to them, an eternal life to Daryl. I'm there in the will. It's written there. My name is there. Your name is there. You're a beneficiary of the will, the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. What am I going to give for you? I give you my whole life. Drain myself of everything that I am for your sake. Let's um, imagine a story. Imagine that we, all of us here, go traveling to a foreign country, to a dictatorship that is not on friendly terms with the United Kingdom. Somehow we fall foul of the, of the boss man and we wind up in prison on death row. We're all going to die. And then our uh, illustrious prime minister makes a deal with the dictator to say, I will come to you and you may execute me if you will only release those people from prison. Now imagine how we feel as, as they kind of open the doors and we, we come out. How do you feel? Wow, this person has died for me. What passion to accept that suffering that I was destined for in my place. But the tricky thing is, we're still in the country of the dictator. We're out of prison, but we're still there. We still live under that dictator's rules. And those rules for us are things like try harder, do better. Um, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a rule that is by guilt and fear and shame. You can't show who you are. Because, I mean, there are people here, honestly, there's people here, you really think, no, you don't. You portray yourself, I'm quite a good person. I do that too sometimes. But when we look in the mirror in the morning, you think, do you know something? I know me in a way nobody else knows me. I'm not sure if anybody else has had this thought, but I often have this thought. How could anyone really love me? Now, if you meet my wife, she's an amazing person. She knows me and she loves me. Jesus knows me even better and he loves me. That law of guilt and fear and shame that keeps us locked up is the kingdom of the, dom the domain of darkness is what the Bible calls it. So the cross has delivered us from this, this death. How is it that we get to be free from the rule? That's the resurrection. That's where new life hits. Where the power, it's, it's as if, try and imagine that the, the, the entire arsenal of this dictator, to, to destroy the prime minister is so important to him. He just, every bullet, every bomb and weapon is directed at destroying this man until his whole military power is exhausted. There's not a single weapon that can be fired in the entire country. We find ourselves free. And the prime minister, well, Jesus raises from the dead. So we can just walk out. There is simply no weapon left 
in that kingdom that, that can damage us. There just isn't. And so the Bible says that we're transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved son, Jesus. We are empowered by the resurrection to live a new life, free from guilt, free from shame, free from fear. A life where you can be who you are and find that you're loved. You don't have to pretend anymore. You don't have to try to be a nice person anymore. The power of God empowers us to live in the resurrected life of Jesus Christ in the kingdom of his son. So we're saved from something, but we're saved to a new life in the kingdom of God's beloved son. In Colossians, there's lots more words here. Um, I won't find the page, but it's in this blue book, I promise you. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, I'm going to point some of this out in a minute. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the cross. So first of all, God calls us to die with his son Jesus. There is no bloodshed for you in this. It's a lot of bloodshed for Jesus. But there's a mystery where we are called to participate in the death of Jesus. You get to die with him. And you get to be raised with him. We all were, the Bible calls us dead in our sins. So we were living in a way where we we're actually living dead people, kind of like a zombie apocalypse. We're, we're stuck in this place where we live in our own mess, knowing that God's judgment, we deserve it. And just only anticipating death. So we were dead in our sins, but God made us alive in Christ. We didn't do it ourselves. He did it by having cancelled this charge. So with me, there's a list of things that say, Daryl did this and this and this and this and this. Honestly, I could, I could tell you a lot of that list. And my ears burn as I think of it. Shameful things I've done, ways I've hurt people. There's that list. God cancelled it. How did he cancel it? He cancelled it by nailing it to the cross. And in doing that, the Bible says Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities. Who are they? Those are the powers and authorities that tell you that you are worthless, that you are powerless, that you are disgusting, that no one could really love you. That is the powers that Jesus disarmed in the cross. And he did it by laying his life down. And he did it uh, by making... It's interesting, Jesus made a spectacle of himself and the Bible says... Actually, he was making a spectacle of these powers. The righteous Jesus, suffering as a criminal, and as heaven looks on, they go, that's wrong. Who could possibly do that? These powers and authorities that hold us in our mess. He triumphed over them in the cross. So... You and I are invited, so let's put it this way, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, it's not just an event, it is a way, it's a pathway. It's a pathway out of the shame, the guilt and the fear of your current life, if you are not a believer in Jesus, into this new kingdom of God's Son. You and I are invited to escape the power of death that rules through fear, guilt and shame by dying with Christ and then rising with him. The mystery is, friends, your heart will continue to beat through your death and resurrection. You may not even feel very much. But there is a, a, an eternal reality that transacts when a person chooses to believe in Jesus Christ. There's something foundational and real that will happen in your life the moment you choose to take hold of the death of Jesus for your sins and his resurrection for your life. Eternal power is released into your life. 
that Jesus won for you, whether you take it up or not. Because he died for the sins of the whole world, including you. So how do we do this? We accept the death of Jesus as a death on our behalf. And by doing that, we can leave behind this old person, the one who continually lives afraid, living for themselves, doing stuff that you're ashamed of, but you can't stop, just drowning in shame and pretending to everybody that you're okay, and come alive as a new creature in Jesus Christ. This is a call to a relationship with a God who loves you without limit through Jesus Christ. To be known and to be loved by someone who knows the real you and loves you the way that you are. Friends, I invite you to hear this call today. If your heart says, I want that, do something right now that will respond. Dave's going to lead us in a whole bunch of stuff. But I just want to say to you, in this moment, if, if this has hit you, do something. If you've got a watch on your hand, take it off and put it on the other hand. Or put something from one pocket into the other. Do something that says, I'm responding to God right now. Take, just take a moment. You can do it quietly. No one has to see it. Do something that you're making your choice to respond to Jesus Christ. Amen. going to just enter a, you know, an extended time of response in many ways. We're going to sing now and then go into communion. If someone can go and get the children and invite them back, that would be great. But I just particularly say if what Daryl has shared is new to you particularly and if it's resonating with you now, if you're sensing something inside, that's God. It's God calling you. It's God saying, I love you. It's God saying, Come. Come and make this the day when your life changes. Come, I want to make you fully alive. You know, as we sing this song, it's a chance to just respond in your own words. It, it can simply be by saying, God, I don't necessarily understand all of this yet, but I know I want to follow you. I know I'm sorry that I've lived my life my way, and I now want to follow your way. Help me understand what the message of Easter is about. And I follow you. I give my life to you now. It doesn't matter what words you say. You know, God knows your heart. Just say whatever you want to to him. And for many of us who've, you know, done that many years ago, today also is a chance to reaffirm that. Maybe we've drifted in recent years. Maybe we, this Easter Sunday, actually, we know that we're not where we've been. And that Jesus invites us back to follow him wholeheartedly again. And for some of us, that might mean laying down some stuff that we need to lay down and say sorry for and lay it down at the foot of the cross and just affirm our commitment to follow Jesus and to receive his love afresh again. So can I invite you to stand? And we're going to sing now. And just as we're singing, you might want to respond in your own way. But just let God meet you and reaffirm his love for you today. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him. The ground began to shake, the 
stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this he showed them his hands and his side the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says the same to us today, this Easter Sunday, 2024. He stands here with us in this room and says, peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he too afresh breathes his Holy Spirit on us now. His Holy Spirit to come and give us that peace, to come and give us that boldness, to come and give us that courage to go out into this world and to proclaim that he is alive and that that changes everything. So may the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let's share with one another as our children return a sign of the peace. And if you don't know what that means, it just means you turn to each other and you just say, peace be with you. It's sharing God's peace. It's blessing each other with God's peace this Easter day. We can continue that over coffee. But we come now and gather around the Lord's table remembering that first time that Jesus did this on that Maundy Thursday, the night before he died. Many of us shared communion together in in just a lovely evening on Thursday evening. And then on Saturday, it's not Friday, we were here. The cross was in the middle of the church and we were all gathered around it for two hours of silence and then our last hour at the cross and just in the middle of that two hours of silence I knelt at the cross and I knelt before this cross in the middle of the room and I just was imagining Jesus hanging from that cross for me and for you and just as I was praying and as I was imagining Jesus looking down on me I just sense Jesus say, tell them. Tell them that this is just how much I love them. As he hung there with his arms open wide, with nails through his arms and feet, with blood pouring down his his face and his back, gasping for breath, giving everything for us. He says, this is how much I love you. I'm doing this for you. And just my prayer is that today, each person, but particularly those of you who don't know that, haven't known that before, would know God's love would know Jesus' love for you as he hung there on the cross. He did it for you. And that's what we celebrate now in the breaking of bread. We just remember and we give thanks. And this gift of bread and wine in many ways is Jesus saying, this is my love gift for you to tell you how much I love you. So the Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give thanks and praise. Jesus, we thank you for creating the world. For creating the world. For coming to earth. For coming to earth. For showing us what God is like. For showing us what God is like. For dying to set us free. For dying to set us free. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond no measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his
Jesus had supper with his friends and he took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks to you, Father, and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Father, today we remember Jesus. His body is the bread of life. And at the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. Father, we do this to remember Jesus. He has forgiven us. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ will come again. Jesus Christ will come again. Father, as we remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit that the bread and wine we bring before you may be for us Christ's body and his blood. Pour out your spirit on us that we may love one another as we work for the peace of the earth and wait for Jesus to come in glory. For honour and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And we say the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith. Whatever faith you have, however big or however small today, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you because he loves you. And his blood, which he shed for you, Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. We're going to take communion together in two places at the front, kneeling at the altar rail and at the back by the font, and you'll be directed which way to go. Um, There's non-alcoholic wine at the front. All the bread is gluten-free. If you don't want to receive communion today, if you're not quite sure what you believe still and don't want to receive them, then please just come and put your hands together like this and we'd love to give you a blessing. And we can do that with children um, too. But I also want to say, if you have been stirred this morning by God's, and if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know this, but I want to know this. I want to know Jesus' love. I want to follow him. I want to give my life to him today. But perhaps you don't know how to do that. Then there are going to be some people, some prayer ministers who will be standing here by the pulpit here. And just as you come up, you know, either before you have communion or after you have communion or if you just want to go there, then just go to them and say, I want to follow Jesus. 
And they will lead you through a prayer. They will lead you through the rest. But just say, I want to follow Jesus. Will you pray for me? And they would love to do that. And if you want to come and receive prayer for anything else today, we particularly had a sense before the service, if God wants to bring healing and restoration today, then come and receive prayer. I, I'm trusting that prayer ministers will come in a moment and receive communion first with the band and then be there for people. So come and allow God to continue to meet you. And after um, the band has played, we're going to sing a couple of songs. And I just want to invite, you know, actually to you to stand and to sing out these songs as a worship time as people continue to uh, receive communion here on this special day. So the band and prayer ministers first and those sharing communion.
Going to, we've got one more song to sing in a moment, but we're going to do the notices and the blessing. And if you need to go, you need to go. But if you want to stay for the final song, do do just take a seat for a moment. Um, this coming Saturday is our next men's breakfast. Any men, uh, very welcome to come uh, downstairs at Weatherspoons, half past eight. Next Sunday, we've got, I haven't had one for a while, we've got a bring and share lunch after the service next Sunday. So do come and bring a main course or a pudding. 
and um, Jess will get that set up straight after our uh, service next Sunday. Great chance to get to know each other. If you are fairly new here, then please do stay because that's a great opportunity to get to know people. And um, coming up soon is the Alive course, and here's a quick trailer, which really is a great place to start exploring this story or just continue to explore this story if that is for you. Are you looking to find love and hope and peace and freedom and purpose in your life? This week we've been exploring again the amazing story of Easter, that week they call Holy Week, a week which is full of darkness and sadness and misunderstanding and death and grief and pain and suffering. It's a story in some ways which makes no sense and yet on that first Easter morning everything changed because the tomb was empty. And the tomb being empty meant that actually Jesus had come back to life. He was not dead. He was alive. And Christians believe that changes everything. That we could find love and hope and peace and freedom and purpose in a new way that we too can become fully alive. And we want to invite anyone to explore this amazing story of Easter and the resurrection. There's a new course which we're running, which is called Alive, which looks at these five themes in the light of different resurrection appearances of Jesus. It's a really relaxed course. It's going to be a 15-minute video followed by discussion. And you can ask any question. And you can come whether you've got no faith or whether you've got a little bit of faith or whether you've been a Christian for many years. We'd love to invite you to join us to explore how we can be fully alive because Jesus is alive. We're going to be running two courses, one at uh, the Littleton Well uh, Cafe next to the Priory in the evenings on Monday evenings, starting on Monday the 15th of April. It's going to be 7.30 to 8.45. And then another course at uh, St Mary's in Pickersley, a daytime course, 11.30 in the morning after their refreshed cafe, and there's going to be a free soup lunch there too. We'd love to invite you to join us to come and explore this story more. Is he alive? How can we be fully alive? You never know, it just might completely change your life. So do um, join that course if that would be helpful for you. And uh, do think, who might you invite to join on that? We've got a few flyers. We've got some uh, alive newspapers. Go and grab one of those on the way out. And if you want to find out more about what Daryl was talking about earlier, then grab one of these Why Easter books and talk to us. We would love to connect you up a little bit more. If you're new um, do and want to connect up and find out more about what's going on here, then uh, do click that button on our website. But a final blessing. Let's stand, shall we? Go out into the world as the Easter people of God in this place. And may the God who raised Jesus from the dead grant you grace. The Son who gave his life for you give you peace. And the Spirit who is with you day by day inspire you to greater service, both now and forevermore. Amen. And after the next song and coffee, it will be Easter egg rolling time. If you need to go with children, go now. But if you want to stay for the final song, do. Thank you for coming. Do come and join us next Sunday. And do come and connect it up with us if you want to know more.